Stanford University. Right, so you've told me a little bit about the culture of the department. Um, you were chair of the economics department twice, I believe. Can you tell me a little bit about what that entailed? Yes, well, being chair twice is a bit unusual. But in a way, I could see it coming for some time because uh, I had been uh, vice chair. Uh, and there seems to have been a kind of a tradition of economic historians serving as chair. Mo Abramowitz was chair during the uh, turbulent times of the 70s. Uh, Paul David was chair. Uh, in fact, in a way, he was chair when I was uh, recruited uh, by Stanford. And after him, Nate Rosenberg uh, was chair. So I don't know what it is about economic historians that made us uh, uh, maybe because we weren't considered to be attached to uh, any, uh, any major faction. Uh, but in any case, uh, that was coming. John Chauvin, by the way, I did know from all the way back in our days at Yale. I was a couple years uh, ahead of him. And uh, so that uh, when he uh, asked me to serve as vice chair, I could kind of see that the succession uh, was, uh, was going to happen. Uh, so. Uh, of course, that was, let's see, 1989 to 93 or 4. Uh, anyway, it was four years the first time and then two years the next time. Uh, immediately things began to happen. Uh, there were budget problems. Uh, budget problems were a real headache, but they simplify the life of a department chair because you have a hiring freeze and uh, uh, can't do all that much. Uh, we certainly had some decisions to make. Uh, you know, by and large, when you're chair, you wonder where your time goes. And people will ask you, well, exactly what does a department chair do? And you're often hard pressed to say exactly what productive activity you did uh, during your day. Uh, in fact, you know, I would sometimes entertain the idea of. Uh, what happened? I used to have a good job. I was a professor. And now I'm a kind of a paid agent getting hounded on all sides by these very smart, successful, affluent people, and yet they want me to uh, serve their needs. But that was only on bad days. Uh, other days uh, it had, uh, had its uh, rewards. And certainly uh, looking at the long trajectory from the 80s down to the present day, uh, it's been a success story for the Stanford Economics Department. Uh, as measured not just by our reputation and the big names we've been hiring, but I think uh, the quality, uh, the quality of department life and, uh, and the uh, uh, success of our grad students. Uh, so that I can feel uh, somewhat good about, having played some uh, role there. Uh, I mean, the most painful parts would be true for everybody, having to call somebody up to say, you know, your tenure was not approved in the department meeting today. That is something I would prefer not ever to have to do, but uh, somebody's got to do it, and that's part of the, uh, uh, the chair's uh, job. Uh, junior faculty mentoring is part of the responsibility, and there, not that you give direct advice to everybody, but typically you'll have a consultation with uh, someone in the field, and so you do feel you're, you're in touch, more, more in touch with the uh, fields of young people in uh, various uh, necks of the woods. Uh, so uh, that part was all uh, uh, very memorable. Now maybe uh, rather, oh well, how is it that I became chair a second time? Well, uh, my successor as chair was John Penn Cabell, and John was a very successful, very widely appreciated uh, chair. This would be in the mid-1990s. So much so that people really wanted him to sign up for a second term. Well, uh, somehow the dean's office got the idea that that was all set, whereas John felt he had never made any such promise. 
Uh, and finally, when they prevailed on him, he said, well, he would sign up for a second term, but only after taking a sabbatical in between. So there was a crisis. He needed to have a new chair on very short notice. This must have been quite late in the year, in May. Uh, and the reasoning was, well, only a recent former chair could possibly step back into the office on short notice. So they came to me, and uh, I uh, reluctantly said yes. And then John Pencavill himself said, well, you know, if you're going to do it for one more year, you may as well do it for two more years. <laughs> <laughs> A very self-interested comment, but uh, I guess he was right about that. So somehow I came in for a, uh, a second time around. Uh, going back to my first term, probably the biggest event of all was the move to the new economics building, uh, known as the Landau Building. We were in Encina Hall on the fourth floor. And that was a very nice location, but we were short on space. And we wanted to grow. We had plans to grow. Uh, and they said there was just nothing that could be done. There was talk about maybe uh, redoing something in that central section of Encina Hall that talk ended with the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, that was a section that had been damaged by fire uh, back in the 70s. And after the earthquake, they said, there's no way. Uh, it would be prohibitively expensive. You'd be better off raising money for a new building than building this one, than trying to do something more in Encina Hall. OK, we accepted that answer. Uh, and uh, we were fortunate that we had a new uh, angel in our midst, uh, namely Ralph Landau. Ralph was a very successful chemical engineer. Uh, but after a successful career, he had to sell his company when interest rates hit 22% in approximately 1979. And the whole rest of his life was devoted to pondering and trying to understand how this could ever have happened. So he wanted to study economics. Uh, and so uh, after first making the acquaintance of uh, Nate Rosenberg, Paul David, John Chauvin, uh, he pretty much moved uh, out here and became, uh, not in a bad way, uh, but a kind of a friend, uh, a guy uh, with some money to put in, but who would organize research projects. And the research projects were about his pet interest, not interest rates, but science. Uh, and how science related to productivity and to the, what was seen as the problems of economic performance in the U.S. economy. So he was the natural person to turn to to get a fundraising campaign going. Now, uh, he, Ralph had to withstand very strong pressure from elsewhere on campus, which is that he should give his money to a chemical engineering building. In fact, if you go to the MIT campus, Ralph was an MIT graduate, you will find the Landau Chemical Engineering Building. But Ralph was firm. Uh, he wanted to support economics. Uh, for quite a while, he was the uh, anonymous donor. But uh, based on that, and with the work of John Chauvin and especially uh, Larry Lau, uh, the money was raised to get authorization for uh, this building. So most of that happened uh, when I was chair. So I was involved in many of the discussions. Uh, and uh, we made the move in 1994. So I know space is a real premium around here now. Yes. Was that an issue then in terms of getting this location to build the building? It was a parking lot. Many people were unhappy about the loss of a parking lot. On the other hand, it had been a parking lot listed as building reserve uh, all along. So uh, it was uh, really not a, a misuse or a usurpation uh, on our part uh, when this was uh, designated. Uh, now, some years later, we have our neighbor, the Seeper Building, uh, and uh, it almost seems like a natural uh, architectural unit uh, since the two uh, blend together quite well. Uh, I realize you know, when I look around these parts of the campus, I often say to myself, you know, I used to teach on a farm. Now I teach in a big city because everything's so built up uh, around here. 
But, of course, I think that about all the other buildings. Our buildings, I uh, appreciate for their utility and their, and their good location, so maybe everyone uh, feels that way. Uh, and the one thing you can say is, despite all the, the build-up feel of the campus here in the center of the campus, it's a lot better than building up in the foothills uh, or other places that would be uh, much less uh, environmentally attractive. Right. Um, was it typical for departments to have to build their own buildings? I know that if you have a special center, you go off and build your own building, but I hadn't heard of a department having to fundraise to, <laughs> to, to house itself. Well, uh, I don't know just uh, how much of that tradition there is, but I do think even in those days, 1980s, this uh, entrepreneurial ethos uh, that you want something done, go out and raise the money, uh, was very strong. Uh, at Stanford, and it's only become stronger uh, over the years. I remember when the new Seeper building was open, President Hennessy was there at the opening statement, he, and he remarked with pride that Stanford University had not put one nickel into that building, <laughs> uh, and he thought that's the way it ought to be done. Uh, the uh, thing to worry about is uh, if you do raise the money or you have some money from somewhere, does that mean you can do exactly what you want to do? Uh, hopefully not. But in this case, uh, they made it clear they were perfectly happy for us to have a new building. But uh, it was not going to be a high priority on anyone else's list. Interesting. So I imagine you've gotten quite a few um, interesting visitors over the time here at Stanford. And I wonder if you, um, you and I had talked about um, the visit of Gorbachev in the oh. 1990, and I wonder if you might tell that story. Yeah, I will. Uh, it was, uh, it seemed like a momentous event uh, at the time. But, uh, and I tend to date things from, well, were we over in Encina or were we here in Landau? And this was definitely when we were in Encina, so that would be about when you're talking about. Uh, I'm sitting at my desk, call comes in from, I think, the president's office, and it is, would members of the economics department be available to meet with an economic advisor to President Gorbachev at uh, such and such a date in the future? Now, this is a pretty strange. <laughs> you're, not, you're not suggesting, you know, meet me so-and-so on such and such a day. You're just saying, uh, so I said, well, yes, I think so. Sure, I could, should be able to round up a group. Uh, and what later emerged was the real plan was for Gorbachev himself to come and make a visit to Stanford. And it was a I don't mean this to be offensive, but I really think they needed a kind of a cover story. And this was their cover story, which is that Gorbachev would be seeking the advice of Stanford economists because uh, he was trying to restructure, or reconfigure. Uh, it was the era of glasnost, uh, the Soviet economy. Not to be a capitalist economy, but to be more like a, uh, a market-based system. So, but that initial call, even though I don't think it was ever a very serious part of the meeting, uh, having put out this story, uh, they felt uh, they had to go through with it. Now, it probably it was only chance that he happened to call the economics department. They might have called Hoover, or economists there. They might have called the business school. Uh, they might have called uh, other places. But in fact, they called economics. So John Chauvin, who was then CEPR director, and I, uh, the department chair, were assigned to appoint 20 economists to come and have a meeting, not with Gorbachev, but with an economic advisor that he brought along with him. Well, uh, I think we probably never made as many enemies in such a short time as we did when we uh, came up with those names. Because it's not that people had specific advice to give, but the word was out that this was going to be a big event. And certainly Gorbachev's visit was a big event. Uh, and uh, some, anyone who had a chance wanted to be there. So we tried to do our best to be <laughs> representative, to have uh, people from Hoover, uh, to have uh, people from uh, food research that was still around at that time, uh, and from the business school as well as from uh, economics. We had a very cordial meeting. But the big event was Gorbachev's uh, visit uh, himself. Uh, and uh, it was historic uh, 
if you look back, you know, you might wonder, well, what was the, its historic meaning? Now, I had a certain special feel for this, completely coincidental, but I had made a trip to the Soviet Union uh, with a group of economic historians in 1988. Uh, and it was considered very innovative and risky at the time. Uh, we were meeting with a group from the Soviet Academy of Sciences, and the understanding was we would discuss American economic history, they would discuss Soviet economic history so that we wouldn't get into a controversy about Marxist interpretations or Soviet interpretations of American economic history. But it was very memorable because revolution was in the air. We arrived at Estonia, Tallinn, that was the first leg, and there was a lot of uh, anti-Russian hostility on the part of the Estonians. We then went by train to St. Petersburg, and there we saw a lot of wonderful sightseeing, but the most memorable was meeting with a young economist there, uh, and thinking that we might be watched at every turn. We took separate cars, took roundabout routes, ending up at his apartment. And this tiny little two-room apartment was stocked wall to wall with Western books, books on Western economics as well as history. Uh, and we had this very secretive uh, conversation where he said, you know, it's like every day you go to work and someone will say, you won't believe what just happened. The people were getting bolder and saying things and doing things that would have been unthinkable just a few years. So it wasn't all that surprising that something dramatic was about to happen. Uh, but there was a lot of uh, kind of jocular talk about Gorbachev's real purpose was to arrange uh, for where he would live after his departure from the Soviet Union, uh, much the way Kerensky uh, came to Stanford after uh, World War I. Uh, that did not prove to be the case, but it did prove to be the case that things did not go smoothly uh, for uh, the rest of the way. So it was, uh, it belongs, it's a part of Stanford history. Uh, my little window into it will just be one small piece of that history, but no one who was part of it, I think, will, will forget. Right. So take me back to this visit to Russia, because I hadn't heard about that before. Um, uh, what was the result of those meetings? Uh, no, uh, the only result is not that we were actually making, making decisions. Uh, there was a woman named Carol Leonard, uh, who was a Russian historian and had uh, kind of taken it on herself that actually she was trying to uh, remake herself as an economic historian, had taken courses at Caltech and so on. So she has come to know uh, quite a few people in the field of economic history. So she, I don't know if it was her idea, but it was at least the idea of uh, both sides and the American government found it very attractive because they were trying to cultivate um, relations between scientists and, you know, we were kind of scientists. Um, so that's really about all it, all it was. And it was successful in the sense that we made lasting acquaintances. We certainly got a strong uh, impression. Uh, I remember coming in with a, a copy, Hedrick Smith had a book uh, about Russia. And the whole question of would we be allowed to bring <laughs> Uh, written material into the country uh, was talked about. Well, somehow I got it in there. I made a point of leaving that book in case uh, somebody wanted to read it. No doubt we had delusions of grandeur, the idea that we were part of this uh, overall upheaval. But uh, the sequel is there were plans for a return visit. Maybe not the identical groups, but overlapping groups. And we would uh, meet in Moscow. And this was uh, 1995. Uh, I remember it because I was on sabbatical at uh, Cambridge, England at that time. Well, by 1995, the U.S. government had no interest whatsoever uh, in promoting acquaintances with uh, American scientists and uh, Russian scientists. The Cold War was over. What would be the point? I was very short-sighted. Uh, somehow, Carol Leonard and a few others cobbled up a few dollars and ruples to get us uh, back together. So we did make that trip, uh, and it was extremely interesting to re-encounter some of the very same uh, people and to get their impressions. 1995 was still pretty hopeful uh, in terms of academic freedom. 
uh, and uh, it was really a, kind of a very candid exchange of thoughts. On the other hand, this idea that they had gone from a position of world importance to a position that the U.S. government regarded as being of little importance even to the U.S., uh, well, that, that was uh, quite a blow, I think, to many of our counterparts on the Russian side. Oh, very interesting. And then back to Stanford and Gor the Gorbachev visit. So yeah. this meeting happened. Was there anything memorable about the meeting? I honestly can't remember. People yeah. tossed questions around. Uh, it was not, not as though this guy necessarily uh, had, had great authority to, uh, to enact any of the policies that we might have recommended or, or anything else. No, it was uh, the big public lecture memorial auditorium was the memorable event. I'm sure Gorbachev himself had other meetings, uh, but uh, the Hoover people presented him with a poster from World War II. I mean, they had this rich collection of wartime posters, and I think he was very moved. Uh, and uh, his wife was with him, I believe. Uh, so for them, it was, it was very touching. Mm -hmm. yeah. While we're talking about the Hoover, I wanted to ask about um, and the business school, too, I guess. I wanted to ask about the interaction between um, the economists in, in all of these different places. Well, let me start with the business school. One of the uh, oddities, and to this day, uh, I don't feel I understand it well, but we have a world-class economics department located at the business school. And you might ask, why do they do it? Why do we have this duplicate? <laughs> it's not a direct duplicate. Uh, they may not feel they have the same responsibility to cover all the branches of economics, but really they cover a lot of them. They have pure theorists, they have development people, they have applied uh, industrial people, uh, and yet we operate about as separately as you can imagine. When we discuss business, nobody has a joint appointment between business school and economics. Other departments, that seems to be le less true, but it's true for economics. Uh, and. It, 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 fortunately, it's not a matter of hostility. We certainly have collaborations. Uh, we have uh, workshops uh, that work together. Students are going both ways. If you want to be a study of finance, you probably want to go and study with Daryl Duffy in the business school. So uh, on the whole, it's a constructive relationship, but we compete with each other. We compete for grad students. We sometimes compete for faculty members, and we compete for, for research funding. So uh, that's, I guess, that kind of proliferation uh, is just the way things are on the uh, big university campuses to, today. I mean, the actual founding of the business school goes back to the 20s, and that was happening lots of places. And I presume the basis for that was that academic and economics was just too academic, uh, not that practical in its value to business managers. And that would be understandable uh, enough but they've now moved well beyond <laughs> just teaching business management. Um, now, Hoover's a bit different because they don't run a program with, with students, uh, and we have quite a few people uh, who have joint appointments, or at least part-time appointments uh, at the Hoover. And uh, w when I was department chairman, on the whole, it was a constructive relationship, uh, since if we'd be trying to recruit a big uh, outside name, that person would be often interested in an affiliation with Hoover. And uh, I was able to work very well uh, with John Raisian uh, at that time. I mean, it's, it's all pretty simple when you have a common objective. Uh, it's just a matter of money. <laughs> uh, maybe on other things, uh, th there might have been some uh, occasional differences of perspective. No doubt uh, there have been. But uh, no, no deep hostility. Now, uh, w one comparison you might want to make is between Hoover and Seeper. When Seeper was founded, the idea was, look, you know, uh, other places at Stanford seem to tap into the fundraising networks uh, better than we do. Uh, we have people working on interesting issues related to technology and foreign trade and macroeconomics, and yet uh, we don't have a kind of relationship with the Silicon Valley crowd. So that was the strategy, that we should be kind of not matching Hoover, but competing with Hoover with a slightly different uh, product. So uh, since I've never been, uh, I've been to occasional 
seminars and talks and so on at Hoover, but uh, nothing much to speak of. But many of the donors and potential donors uh, do some choose one over the other, some contribute to both. So you'll sometimes hear them comparing <laughs> what they're hearing. They'll say things like, well, at Hoover, you know, they know what they think and what we should do. You know, here at CEPR, <laughs> they're not so sure. And that maybe that's right, because Super CEPR tries very hard uh, to have a diversity of uh, political perspectives and economic perspectives. Uh, so uh, they are different, uh, even if they do compete for uh, fundraiser donor uh, interest. Interesting. And, and you were the director of CEPR for a year, is that right? Well, it was almost a technicality. I was uh, because John Chauvin was CEPR director and he became dean, dean of h &S. And everyone agreed the person we want, wanted for CEPR director was John Taylor. Uh, John was back from Washington, but he was writing a textbook, introductory economics textbook. So he would not agree to do it that year. And so although I might have been designated a kind of acting director Somehow, John Chauvin is always, always very generously lists me as a former director. Uh, it was a successful year. It was the year we moved from uh, Encina to Landau Building. At that time, Seeper had the ground floor uh, of this building. Uh, but really, I, my administration at Seeper had only one objective, and that objective was to persuade John Taylor to become director. because He had <laughs> said that he wouldn't be director that year. He hadn't said for sure that he would be director. Uh, at the end of the year, we uh, convinced him. He agreed. Uh, so I declared victory and stepped down. And that's <laughs> the end of my short career as a policy yeah. center director. Um, and then just one more question about the Hoover. Um, both Milton Friedman and uh, Douglas North were there at different times. Is that right? Well, there are many prominent economists yes. have had affiliations with Hoover. Uh, with Milton, I think it was during his retirement, but of course he had a very long and active uh, retirement. Gary Becker uh, was also affiliated with Hoover, and I think there'd be uh, quite a long list of others. So on the whole, uh, it's been an asset, a strength for us that we have these people in close proximity. And that's in addition to the, uh, the young people, the national fellows, others who come and visit, visit uh, at Hoover. Uh, among the senior economists, yeah, they tend to be of a conservative stripe. The younger ones, I think it's pretty much the same diversity uh, that you would encounter almost everywhere. But since you mentioned Doug North, uh, grand old man uh, of economic history, one of the founders of the so-called new economic history, uh, and uh, a, a guy uh, who uh, also lived a uh, long uh, life, died in his 90s just last year, uh, he maintained that affiliation. Uh, now, Doug would always, uh, and, and so Keith and I uh, knew Doug and Elizabeth, I met them every year. He would often come back from a session or a day or, uh, at the office at Hoover saying, you know, I don't think they really knew what they were getting when they asked me to be a fellow. I mean, we have a Nobel Prize, I guess it helps. <laughs> but Doug was an eclectic thinker uh, and uh, impossible to classify. So, uh, well, all, all, all I will say is it's to Hoover's credit uh, that they kept uh, Doug as a member of our intellectual community over all those years. Right. Okay, let's talk about um, teaching a little yes. bit. I'd love to hear a little bit about your approach to teaching economics. Yeah, well, let me start with the grad students. See, when I visited here in 1978 from Michigan, I went back home to Michigan on three thesis committees. Uh, and I said to myself, you know, it's going to be 10 years at Michigan or more before I have three comparable students, all good, all people working in fields uh, that actually had been influenced by my own research interests. So that was real. I really had my eye on Stanford, and I have not been disappointed, as I've indicated. The close work with grad students, uh, who certainly have not been carbon copies of me or Paul David or anyone, but they, uh, they've been very uh, 
good people, good scholars, uh, a, g a goodly number of them have gone on to successful academic careers in and around uh, economic history. So that's a candid answer. Uh, perhaps a politically correct answer would be to say the undergraduates came first, but the honest truth is the grad students came first because they're the ones you have a, a more intimate uh, working professional uh, relationship with. But my undergraduate teaching has been very rewarding too. I guess uh, uh, it better have been because I've signed up to teach my undergraduate course again uh, next year. This is uh, American, <laughs> uh, American Economic American History. American Economic History. It's always been uh, attracted a good uh, enrollment. And since I didn't teach it last year, I assume I'll get some turnout. I have worked on it uh, over the years to try to figure out what the best approach uh, would be. Uh, I sometimes regret that we and probably almost everyone have moved so far in the direction of relying on PowerPoint. Uh, you can do a lot of things with PowerPoint that you can't do otherwise, and especially if you're trying to present quantitative material or graphical material. Uh, so I don't uh, begrudge it, but I sometimes <laughs> think back to the days of uh, using the blackboard or the chalkboard and kind of working things out with uh, uh, students and having much, uh, it seems like you had much more in the way of active uh, interaction and discussion, even in a fairly large class uh, that way. Nonetheless, that's a matter of uh, technology, not so much about the spirit. The thing is, uh, teaching grad students, uh, we have a mission. The mission is these are professional, professional economists on their way to being, if not already, socialized into the worldview of economics. And our mission is to explain to them that their worldview should be more historical than the mainstream tradition of economics is. Uh, and that seems to, it certainly gives you a sense of purpose and a way of couching the material. With the undergraduates, even though most of my students are economics majors, they're not fully socialized uh, into the economics uh, perspective. Uh, in fact, Stanford being a diverse uh, place in terms of economics, I'm not sure that we even convey to our majors th that much in the way of a single-minded perspective. Nonetheless, I use the same approach uh, while also trying to make the course accessible to people coming from history who want to say, well, what am I going to need to know as background uh, material? in American economic history. Uh, now, one thing that I have um, had to relearn since I first started teaching back at Yale, I had the idea of these are such good topics, these debates, like the slavery debate and the railroad debate uh, and the safety valve debate and so on, that instead of just teaching them an answer, we should generate a discussion, a debate. You have them read something, and they don't have to buy that. Learn to think critically. Uh, they should write a critique of something they've read. Now, I still hear people, teachers, talking along this line about what the object of pedagogy should be. I came to feel that that approach was not working. The students just did not bring enough into the classroom in order to be able to engage in these debates in a meaningful, useful way. Uh, and what really got to me was reading in one of the course evaluations at the end of one of those early courses, most of what you learn in this course is not true. Uh. And what he meant by that was, you hear all these ideas and then we shoot them down uh, under the theory that we are teaching them how to think and how to be critical. I just thought, well, students are not taking this particular class in order to hone their critical skills. They're taking it to get some broad sense. Uh, of what was happening in the American economy. Where did American prosperity come from? And when did it come? And uh, what were the instruments? What were the broader implications? So I now do much more in the way of presenting a synthesis, uh, an overview, trying to help the students to tie things together, all the while trying whenever I can to indicate, well, there are other perspectives here. You know, uh, this is the way I would interpret it if I were so-and-so. Uh, so that I'm not just indoctrinating them, but I think that's what they need uh, because, uh, uh, oh, they've all had American history, although even that you can't assume since we have so many international students now, but even the ones who've had American history don't remember it all that well or they don't have, have a kind of working cognitive map of it. So it's, you might say it's more spoon feeding, 
But I, I think students also find it intellectually uh, stimulating. And so that's really the way I've moved. And the broad question uh, that dominates is American world economic preeminence. When did it happen? Where did it come from? Really, it's the same as my research question, uh, dating back to the 80s. So of course, we cover minerals and, uh, and the, uh, the, the knowledge economy character of the, uh, of the mineral system uh, back in the 19th century. We have to do slavery, uh, since I think slavery belongs in any American economic history course. I don't want to have it be a course that leaves out uh, the South. And Great Depression, uh, New Deal, these are kind of defining institutions and, uh, and moments. I mean, I often feel the pressure of the quarter system, that you're trying to pack so much in here. It might be nice to teach a course in uh, oh, post-World War II economic history or something like that, but I haven't had that luxury. It's really just been one course that tries to cover everything. And since you know you can't cover everything, it means you have to pick your topics very uh, carefully. So that's the economic history. Let me talk a little about the, uh, my experience with introductory economics. Back in uh, the 80s, I was tapped to teach the introductory course once or twice. And at that time, we had just one course, Econ 1, taught three times a year, and it tried to cover all of economics in one quarter, micro, macro, everything. Everyone who taught it agreed that this was crazy. I remember Paul Krugman was in our department for two years. He taught it once. <laughs> he said this is said it reminded him of uh, Woody Allen's remark about war and peace. Uh, as it's about Russia. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what can you do? Uh, and uh, others uh, tried it and found it so frustrating. They basically said, "I'm not going to teach this again until you change the system." So after years of thinking we should change, but we can't, we just can't afford it because you're doubling the sections, you're doubling the TA requirements, and where's that money going to come from? Well, it was Mordecai Kurtz who was serving as director of undergraduate studies. Mordecai himself never had anything to do with the introductory course, but his son was a Stanford student, and he was taking the course, and Mordecai looked at the assignments and declared, this course is superficial, which I don't doubt was true, but nonetheless, uh, he basically shamed the administration and said, you say you're going to support quality education for our undergraduates, especially in the first two years? You know, you've got to fund us to make this change. So we did. We went from the Econ 1 system to the Econ 1A, 1B system, make it a two-quarter course. Uh, I, I was very happy teaching the 1A. Inevitably, even though we tried to mix it up, it became micro and macro. Mm -hmm. It gave me more time to discuss the policy aspects of a topic, the institutional aspects, the historical aspects, the philosophical aspects. Uh, I, I felt much happier covering the labor economics issue because, uh, you know, sometimes a little learning can be a dangerous thing. If all you learn is that a labor market is a market like any other market, it seems to me that might do more harm than good. And when it came to a topic like international trade, I always insisted international trade should be covered in the micro part of the course because historically that's really the main source. And I thought, okay, I don't want to just have them leave this course seeing economics has one thing to say about international trade, namely, free trade is best. I want to tell you where that idea comes from, what it's based on, what possible exceptions there might be. But really what I want to do is have you understand that economics is not a set of finished policy conclusions. It's a way of framing the analysis, uh, a framework within which you can develop your own position and uh, your own interpretation of the evidence. I really think we were teaching a better course. But so what I'm leading up to, and the reason I'm using the past tense is, we have now moved back. The department has now moved back to the old Econ 1 system. Where there was a fatal flaw in our setup, 1A, 1B, a two-quarter course. But we never worked up our nerve to say you really have to complete both quarters before you can move on to the intermediate course. Uh, for courses where economics was a prerequisite, like international relations or environmental economics, 
the decision was made, no, Econ 1A would be enough to get you in. So John Taylor and Michael Boskin understandably felt 1B, the macro course, was a second-class citizenship citizen. Of course, the majors had to take both, but for a lot of students, they were taking only micro, not macro, and there was a big drop in, in enrollment between the two. And I never had an answer to this because the idea of saying, let's be absolutely firm, two quarters or nothing, we never quite had the nerve to do that. So that's where we are. History right. comes around. I wanted to just clarify something you said. You said that, um, but inevitably, the 1A and 1B shifted into macro-micro. So did it, why did you say inevitably? Because that division of the subject is so entrenched in the textbooks, in the mindset. We've been through that same cycle in our graduate program in designing the comprehensive exams. The question was, uh, should they be micro or macro? Why not mix them up? Because everyone will agree the, uh, there's no really sharp distinction between them uh, anymore. Historically, there was. It didn't work. There may not be a sharp intellectual distinction, but there is a distinction in terms of the designated fields of the department members. And that means their peer groups, the, the journals that they refer to, the literature that they're dealing with. So that's why I say inevitably. No, we did try uh, to say, well, we'll take money and move it from 1B to 1A and uh, move some other things the other way. Uh, but it didn't work because here's a course that's going to be taught by a lot of different people over the years. It's got to have a fair amount of standardization uh, so that you're not just <laughs> learning some idiosyncratic version of economics. So that, and that standardization drives us into the micro-macro uh, distinction. Right. And so you said there was a differentiation in enrollment, more students were taking the micro? Well, it, we started with, with uh, yeah, 1A came first, and that was micro. That would have been another way to go, would be to randomize or maybe teach macro first, something like that. But really, I don't think there was. Uh, Very interesting. If, if, I, if I'd had an ideal solution, I would certainly have uh, yeah. pushed for it at the time. And so now you're saying it's back to just one quarter, it's yeah. all lumped in. Yeah. And let me tell you, John Taylor is a star teacher in Econ 1, and uh, he, he does it. He finds a way to do it, to bring it together. Yes, everyone agrees uh, that the pace is unreasonably fast. On the other hand, I think we're deluding ourselves if we think the students are mastering the material week by week here. They're getting an, uh, an exposure, an introduction to the field, and maybe despite the fact that I like the other system better, uh, maybe uh, limiting it to one uh, is about as good as uh, the other way. Very interesting. Now, it's a very popular course, is that correct? Well, it's a very it large been, course. Yeah. It's not always the same as popular. But, you know, many students come to Stanford uh, looking to some kind of career in the market society uh, out there in business or entrepreneurship or something like that. And so they tend to think they should have economics, and I think they're right about that. Uh, so it is, uh, but as to whether it's popular, uh, a lot of people take one course in economics and they say, I hated it. It was my worst subject. And there are a lot of reasons why people uh, might react that way. I've heard that many times over the years. Not particularly about Stanford, but I've heard it. John Taylor uh, was the other way around. People found him so inspiring uh, that he uh, actually attracted more people who were just taking one course, they thought, uh, end up uh, going on and uh, maybe becoming uh, majors. Right. Speaking of majors, has economics been a pretty popular major? Over the years, it has. Back for years, we were head-to-head -head with the human bio. Uh, for being number one major, but we have gone through the decline over the, I don't know just what the periodization is, last 10 years or so, uh, in favor of computer science. And I know other departments have had an even more severe decline. Uh, I mean, we have raised our technical standards, raised our credits, so maybe we've overshot. Uh, I think we've uh, leveled off now, maybe recovered a bit. But we have experienced uh, some decline. Right. Um, one more question about teaching. You talked about the importance of graduate students. Do you have an approach to working with graduate students? 
Uh, there's no formula. Um, uh, thing, uh, part of the, the Stanford tradition uh, in economic history is to say that we uh, accept economics as the parent discipline. Uh, unlike the old institutional economists and unlike the radical economists of the 60s and 70s, uh, we're not anti-economics. We're not trying to overthrow anything. But accepting economics as the parent discipline can be understood in very broad terms. Uh, that it's the intellectual style uh, and the idea that whatever you do, it should be couched in historical context, if, it's, if you're going to call it uh, economic history. But as to the specific methodology that you use, you don't want to have a formula. Uh, most economic grad students today are doing applied econometrics. And there tends to be a very standard uh, approach and set of questions that are addressed there. You get a data set, you set up a model, and then you develop an identification strategy, uh, and you uh, come out with your results. Uh, well, we like to think uh, that's not a good way to write economic history. You've got to be aware of the methods. You may want to use them. But that should be only an intermediate input into some kind of larger historical narrative, analytical narrative, but nonetheless a narrative uh, that you're trying to develop. One of the reasons for Abner Greif's uh, success in inspiring and attracting students is uh, his core methodology, at least uh, uh, when he arrived at Stanford, was game theory that is using analysis to interpret historical patterns, uh, historical institutions. Uh, the tradition, intellectual tradition in economics is to teach that international trade is just a natural thing. Adam Smith wrote, people have a natural propensity to truck barter and exchange. You have gains from trade, and so people trade. That's that. But you go back to 11th century Europe, and you ask, how were they conducting this long-distance trade in the absence of long-distance communication, the absence of international law, the absence of, uh, why are you going to trust somebody, uh, you send off a ship? In other words, you have a complex set of institutional relations. Yes, it's a market transaction, but it is not as simple as saying there are gains from trade, and so it happens. So uh, that approach really is a theoretical modeling approach, and then the historical part uh, is to use archival data, information. Yes, if you can quantify it, all the better. But it's not intrinsically uh, an exercise in applied uh, econometrics. Well, I think we, we need to be a, a big enough tent or umbrella to be open to that style of research, as well as to much more econometric uh, style looking, and lots of things uh, in between. So I've advised students uh, all over the, the spectrum. Uh, and uh, one of the things that attracted me into economic history was there seemed to be a little more opportunity to reflect your individuality than uh, in other branches of economics. And I like to think that is uh, still true. And do your students typically have a research question in mind already when they come to the department, or how do they? Not when they come to the department. Because remember, you're really only committing to a field after your two years of grad work. Oh, of course, people do have, uh, have interests and, and backgrounds. But uh, really, for someone to decide they're going to work in economic history, I, I want to say be an economic historian, because it's probably advisable. Uh, if you're going to work in economic history, to also have another companion field, because uh, so, you go out into the market, you're going to want to be able to present yourself uh, with some breadth. So it might be finance, might be labor economics, might be macro, could be uh, international, uh, lots of things. But the uh, question is, do you have a, a topic in any sense? Uh, yeah, they often do, but you know that third year is a challenge. You're moving from coursework into your own research. And lots of students spend a lot of time trying out different topics uh, and giving up. And I often hear myself saying, you know, you're not going to know what potential that topic has until you really get into it. Don't think that the world's ideal topic is going to fall in your lap. 
you almost have to find it uh, at the end of the tunnel and work it out for yourself. But that's hard. You can say that in abstract. Uh, I'm not the one that's going to be doing the working, although I'm happy. So, you know, sometimes students really want to work in close consultation. Here's what I read today, and what do you think this is? Usually these topics, uh, the specific researchable topics, have to be worked out over time, and more often than not, the question comes out looking very different from the one you thought you were addressing uh, when you first went in. Speaking of students, um, it occurs to me that you must have witnessed sort of a change in the profile of the typical economics student over the decades of your career, and I wondered if you might comment on, on that. Uh, do you mean undergraduates or graduates? Well, that's a good question. Um, yeah. I, I remember looking at some research that was just talking of what a sort of male-dominated major yes. economics was for a long time, and I don't know if that, that was true for both graduates and undergraduates or, or not? Well, it's been an issue uh, all along. And uh, I think maybe we're second to uh, engineering. But unlike other fields like the law, which used to be male dominated and now it's very well integrated, you know, we're still in process. The last time I checked, which is probably the last time I was chairman, uh, our undergraduate majors were about 40% female. And uh, my impression is, it's about the same now. So we have never been so predominantly male that the women have been, well, somewhat outnumbered, but not uh, totally outnumbered. On the other hand, I, I can easily imagine, and many of them do feel, uh, that uh, somehow the subject itself <laughs> is still male-dominated. Uh, in the way questions are framed, uh, to say nothing of the kind of macho style of, uh, of interaction that's often featured. Uh, it, really, uh, I can speak with much more uh, substance uh, about the grad students. Where, you know, used to think, uh, I, I have always been an advocate for uh, having more women uh, in economics. And you might say, well, it doesn't take, <laughs> doesn't take much to say, well, we should do it. But when I say do it, I mean really make it a conscious goal. Uh, that, yeah, we have this illusion that we, there's a single skill set that everyone should be judged by, but the truth is people are complex. They have multiple attributes and virtues and skills, and we should be looking for that as part of a general diversity, means including more women. But the reason I feel that way is how are we ever going to change it from being a male-dominated field to being a more uh, inclusive? You know, I think the only way is more representation. Uh, I mean, if, if you were to ask, well, what traits do women really have that are so different? And why not uh, recruit those traits? I think that would be a mistake. The kind of typecast, <laughs> you're supposed to be a representative woman, and so we want you to play the role of women. I think women have enough of a feeling uh, of that kind already. But it has made a difference, I can say. Uh, even having one woman in the room during a department meeting and having now uh, four or five or six or something like that, still a minority, but I think there's a big difference between six and zero or one. Do you have any examples of that, that difference? Can you think of any examples? Well, you know, I'm retired, <laughs> a little out of date. Uh, and since my retirement, the department took a, an astonishing move. You know, I was just telling you about the uh, discussions about the comprehensive exams. We have now abolished the comprehensive exams. So I was not there for the discussion, but what I heard was that uh, the question of encouraging women in the program was part of the discussion. Uh, question, these are very threatening. <laughs> Uh, and uh, stressful, uh, and I think the argument was, well, uh, you can't take all the stress uh, out of the PhD program, but maybe uh, accumulating it all into this one showdown uh, set of exams uh, is not the only way to do it. You can rely more on the course exams uh, and rely more on the advisor relationship, and that uh, at least this was part of the case. So it's slightly different from what you were asking, but it's just a way of saying that I think having more women present and part of the discussion has led the department to think about things that would have been considered unthinkable not that long ago. Right. 
So when you were chairman or you know in leadership positions in the department, was there ever any kind of conscious effort to say we really need to get a female faculty member or we really need to, with this year's crop of graduate students, you know, yeah, try to there have was. It, it would come and go. Uh, and some years uh, we'd get close to 50% on the entering students. And you might think, I would often think, okay, we're over the hump now. Now the word is going to spread and it'll be downhill from here. And then the following year, you might get two. Uh, somehow uh, this idea that we're very close to a kind of uh, open enrollment <laughs> situation, I, I think has been mistaken. Uh, and, and I think it's been true in more recent years uh, as well. And in terms of the faculty, uh, yes, I remember one committee. Uh, you commented on how many committees I served on. Somehow I found myself on this committee, a committee of three of us. At that time we had zero, no woman in the faculty. And so given that situation, we thought a special effort might make. What our committee did was to look at the faculty of all the I don't know what, top 20, top 25 departments and try to identify all the women in all fields that uh, might be suitable for a Stanford appointment uh, with the idea that, well, that would be, the, we don't want to lower our standards, but we want to make an extra effort to find somebody who might be just the right person uh, who happens to be a woman. Well, that year it was all superseded by the emergence of Susan Acey. Uh, as a uh, as a star caliber uh, uh, candidate uh, coming out of MIT, she had been a PhD student not in our program but in the business school. But really, she's an economic theorist, and she was available. And so, okay, I mean, I'm not proud of this, but Susan's availability led us to drop the whole committee process that we had started, which wasn't looking all that promising uh, anyway. But Susan did join the department, and I was pleased to be the chairman uh, that brought her here. She wasn't the very first woman we had ever had, but she was just about the first, at least uh, at that time, uh, certainly the first tenured uh, woman. Uh, and uh, well, Susan, uh, a few years later, it's partly there's a, there's a spouse to career issue. Uh, she went to uh, Harvard and is now back at Stanford and both Susan and her husband Guido Imbens are now at the business school. So they're part of the broader uh, community. But here in our department we have, I think the number is four, tenured women faculty members uh, and, and a good crop of younger uh, prospects too. Uh, so, uh, you know, there has been progress. Interesting. <laughs> you mentioned um, a macho culture of interaction or something. I don't know if those are your exact yeah, words. Is, I, I, is there one in I economics? I did say, oh yes. Uh, now, it, it hasn't all been the same. But, you know, people dread, uh, grad students dread presenting in a big full workshop and for understandable reasons. Uh, the one thing everyone turns out for every year are the job market talks. And they can be absolutely brutal. And I really think uh, our department in particular had the reputation of being a brutal place to go and give a job talk. Uh, and so uh, what do you mean by brutal? Well, you know, uh, well, in general, the difference between uh, history and economics. Uh, Steve Haber will sometimes say, hey, are we going by history rules or economics rules? History rules means you listen politely for half an hour until the Q&A period, and then you have discussion. Economics rules, you can be interrupted in the first five minutes, and that happens. And you may be completely derailed. Uh, you know, we, I think we did come to realize that this was really not a good idea since, yeah, we're evaluating a speaker, but we're also trying to recruit a speaker, so <laughs> let's not make the person feel totally unwelcome. Uh, so I think there has been a little bit of social uh, pressure and improvement in, in, to the extent of, of, of getting rid of the outright rude, rudeness and, uh, and interruptions. But nonetheless, this idea of you're trying to judge whether the person is fast on their feet uh, and uh, people firing some pretty tough questions, not, not uh, you know, I don't think anybody just hurls uh, insults. 
but you know, sharp analytical questions based on what's been presented. And so that's, that's what economics is like. Huh? Interesting, so not just at Stanford? That Definitely not just at Stanford. Uh, I did do that postdoc at Chicago in 71, 72. Uh, Chicago is, has a reputation even more so <laughs> than what I'm saying about uh, Stanford. So uh, uh, I don't say that every department is like that. I haven't tried all the departments, but I, in general, uh, it's, it's part of the economics culture, or at least it has been. Very interesting, the things you find out. Yes. So <laughs> um, let's talk, though, about um, you were involved with this Summer Institute for High School Economics teachers for a very long time. and That's been a very uh, rewarding uh, measure. It was back in the uh, 80s. State of California instituted a requirement uh, that every uh, graduate of a public high school had to take a course in economics. They didn't require that anyone should be trained to teach a course, <laughs> a classic unfunded uh, mandate. But nonetheless, uh, we knew a lot of people were going to have to be in the classroom teaching economics uh, with little, uh, little in the way of background. We wanted to see what we could do to help. But we quickly determined that we were not. And by we, I really mean uh, John Chauvin, uh, who I think was department chair. And we had an administrator named Edwina Werner, who had a PhD in psychology and who, incidentally, I knew from all the way back at uh, Swarthmore College. So she was particularly uh, urging us, and we even had a fund, a Johnston fund, that would have covered some of the expenses. So it was Edwina Werner's uh, urging that got us to actually do it. We teamed up the very first year with another group on campus that was uh, uh, we had high school teachers in mind. They had uh, middle school and even grade school teachers. Uh, and basically, we have found it so rewarding and so much appreciation that we've been doing it ever since. We quickly realized we can't try to undertake to teach a remedial course in basic economics. Uh, first of all, we don't have the time. And second of all, other places can do it as well as we can. That really is not a good use of our resources. But what we have are the Stanford faculty. We also got some very good advice early on, which is, you know, you have your expertise, but you've got to respect the expertise of the teachers. Don't think you're going to tell them how to teach economics. But we can tell them what our research is about. We can respond to their questions. Uh, we can basically do what we have to offer. And student, the teachers have responded to that, and uh, we got some uh, good uh, uh, assistance within the educational community from a fellow named Don Hill. Uh, and then uh, somewhere along the line, well, it was probably uh, uh, when Seeper moved into the new building, we determined that it would be uh, much better to just run the uh, run the uh, whole institute uh, out of Seeper so that we can make use of their facilities and also their, uh, their staff. Uh, now, for a few years, uh, we held it at the old NBER office, which is up by the Center for Advanced uh, Study on the Hills. That was quite wonderful, to have people up there with these beautiful vistas of the San Francisco Bay and uh, uh, well, this uh, higher, uh, higher education is, uh, is going on. But it's nice down here, too. Uh, and over the years, uh, I think we've gotten better. Uh, that uh, John Chauvin uh, and I, uh, we give two of the lead lectures, but we, then we have lots of other speakers. We try to bring grad students in. We often bring somebody from Stanford to talk about admissions or the athletics program or something uh, like that. And the teachers love coming to Stanford. Uh, word of mouth has been our best uh, recruitment. And we now, looking at uh, the calendar and realizing next year is going to be our 30th annual meeting, uh, we've recruited Ron Abramitsky uh, to be a third member of the leadership with the idea that uh, we hope this uh, will carry on in the future. Uh, the reason that happened was we invited Ron to give a talk and he gave a talk and was so pleased at the reaction and the uh, appeal of the group that he said, oh, if you ever have another opportunity, please think of me. So we brought, we brought him in. 
And uh, Mark Duggan, the new CEPR director, has a keen interest in the program and has been a speaker uh, for each of the last two summers. So uh, there's not too much that you do, <laughs> uh, Stanford or anywhere, that gives you that much of a sense of satisfaction and appreciation for the people uh, right. involved. So the way it works is that you assemble a group of speakers that is just is talking about their current work? We don't try to regiment too much uh, what they do. Uh, we certainly try to tell everybody that, uh, look, these are dedicated uh, uh, teachers uh, with very strong uh, background, but not necessarily a strong background in economics. So please make it accessible. And as to how accessible it is, well, uh, we'll see what the teachers say. And uh, there's, there's quite a wide range, especially some of the younger ones nowadays have had quite a bit of economics and do quite a bit. Some of them are teaching AP courses where it's really is college level material. Others have courses where they struggle to get the students right. motivated in any way at all. So uh, I think that advice about we shouldn't be trying to give them highly specific advice. Uh, but we have morning speakers that basically take the whole morning, 9.30 to 12, uh, with a break. Uh, and uh, so you don't have the feeling that somebody is trying to work through a long lecture. No, the idea is to build the interaction right into the system. And then we have several slots during the week that are dedicated to the teachers uh, sharing each other's uh, expertise. They always have new ideas for lesson plans, new materials. Uh, often they, they will read a, a recent book in economics and have a kind of discussion uh, based on that. Oh, very interesting. Yep. Hmm. All right, well, let's leave the teaching subject. And uh, I wanted to talk to you about all these committees that are on your CV. Yes. How in the world um, did, did the word get out that you were a committee guy? <laughs> that one I don't know, although I did serve on the committee known as the Committee on Committees. It's just it tells you something about how committified uh, Stanford is that it even has a Committee on Committees. But it's because uh, there's an awareness that it tends to be the same old names over and over again. The ones who get kind of uh, known among the uh, active numbers. And that we need a system, a way of pooling our knowledge to uh, come up with uh, to broaden the circle. And uh, you know, of course, they send out emails all the time saying, you know, we're trying to recruit uh, new members. If you have an interest, please get in touch. But hardly anybody is going to re respond to an issue like that. It almost takes a, a bit of recruitment to get somebody to serve. And sometimes it's, it's a bit burdensome. Uh, other times it can be stimulating. And it you, you certainly gives you a window uh, on uh, uh, branches of Stanford and aspects of Stanford that you had nothing much to do with. I'll tell you who I would guess was on more committees than I ever was, and that is John Levin. John Levin, our recently uh, completed uh, chair. Uh, his father was Rick Levin. So even though John himself is a outstanding economist, he won the John Bates Clark Medal, which is given to the best economist under the age of 40. Uh, those of us who've been observing him knew he had a natural flair <laughs> to be an administrator, and one of the indexes of that was he was willing to serve on various committees. And you may have noticed that he's recently been tapped as the new director of the business school. So I think our prognosis has proven true. Oh, interesting. Now that, in my case, I, I really had no interest in going into a a career in the deanship, uh, so, but I, I think it would have been, uh, those paths would have been opened up if I had been more responsive to it. No, a few of them have been uh, memorable, like the committee uh, to bring back the F. Which was its official title. It may not, I think not, actually, that was its popular title, but uh, you may recall that as part of the reforms instituted might have been 60s, might have been 70s, but anyway, it became not possible to fail a course at Stanford. Uh, and the philosophy actually sounded reasonable. It was that your transcript should be a measure of your achievement, not a measure of all the things you ever tried to do. You may have tried lots of things, and we don't write them all down. 
Uh, so that if you happen to take a course and ended up with a failing grade, it would just disappear from the transcript. That almost sounds like a defensible uh, approach, and for years I did defend it uh, in my mind. I thought, okay, this allows me to keep a standards for passing the course are going to be high, they're going to be serious, and if you didn't pass, I'm not going to give you a token C just out of a feeling of generosity. You didn't pass, you didn't pass, and it's as though the, the course didn't happen. Okay, I decided, uh, I, was, I was softening even before agreeing to serve on this committee, but it was serving on the committee it led me to think that was not a very enlightened point of view. We are educators. We are supposed to be trying to, we're dealing with young people, and the idea that, well, we'll treat you as an adult, uh, and uh, especially if it's a self-serving point of view. I'll treat you as an adult, which means it's going to make my job a lot easier. No, the real problem with that uh, no-fail system was not that faculty were eager to give a lot of failing grades and have it stick. No, it was more that it changed the nature of a student's commitment to a course. You would have the phenomenon. Stanford students are very grade conscious. Uh, and students juggling a portfolio of courses, five courses maybe, in a given term, uh, and finally deciding which four or which three they were going to get the best grades in and drop the others at the very end of the term. And why couldn't they? Since if the instructor saw fit to give them a failing grade, it would disappear anyway. Uh, and every faculty member had a story about a student turning in a blue book and at the end writing, if you're considering giving me a D, please give me an F instead. Uh, uh, so uh, something seems wrong. With the thought being that... The thought being that it, the, F would the D would not disappear, so a D was really the worst grade you could give. Uh, and uh, especially if you're in a... It, it's related to. Uh, the kind of culture that I remember John Brovman, the undergraduate dean, saying he's really trying to change the culture uh, by a student culture by which there's all this course hopping or shopping uh, for several weeks and feeling that you could uh, jump into a course uh, in the third or fourth week and uh, not feel that you're doing anything special or out of the way. Uh, and if it's a smallish size course and you're depending on discussion or maybe you have group projects or something like that, it is extremely difficult to get started if you don't know who's in uh, and who uh, isn't. And so uh, related to the proposal to, in the end, we didn't bring back the F, we brought back the not pass. Uh, but uh, it was related to uh, tightening up the drop deadline. Because, see, the drop deadline was meaningless <laughs> under the old system. It became very meaningful uh, indeed. And so I really think it has changed uh, the uh, nature of teaching. And we understood students were going to be unhappy about this. And there were bitter protests. Some of them you could sympathize with, where people thought, look, you know, we thought Stanford was a place that doesn't emphasize grades, and you're saying we should emphasize grades more. We don't like that. Okay, I could sympathize with that. But we also knew that we had the edge because it was a generational matter. Uh, students who came and had lived with the old system were going to be unhappy. Students who arrive and only know the new system uh, are going to think it's just the way things are. And that uh, it was a hot issue right. for about one year. Uh, and after that, it was uh, we've moved into the new system very well. So why did you decide to not really bring back the F, but to bring in NP? I don't think that was part of my <laughs> <laughs> orbit of responsibility, but I assume the reason was that uh, F seems harsh and, and not pass seems a little less harsh. There are some subtler issues there, uh, which is uh, there's uh, an early drop deadline, and then there's a middle range where you can drop but the course will be listed as withdrew with a little W on there. So the, the idea there was the same kind of thing. That, that's not a harsh penalty. It just means you withdrew. But even so, you prefer not to have that on your transcript. And you can still retake courses. Uh, 
Uh, most faculty do not approve of students retaking a course just to raise their grade, especially not if they want to raise a B plus to an A minus. That seems uh, ridiculously uh, wasteful. But nonetheless, students do. And so now there's an indication on the transcript that says that it is a retake. Not a, not a harsh penalty, but maybe a small uh, discouragement. So we would like to think that the whole thing has reallocated resources and attention more towards the things uh, which they ought to be. Oh, very interesting. Um, and I recall reading um, about that committee that people retaking courses was pretty common then if yeah. they had. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't want to sound as though I, I have followed it closely ever since. Uh, maybe retaking uh, still, ha I'm sure it happens to some degree because there is a lot of uh, grade sensitivity, but hopefully not as much uh, as in those old days. Right, very interesting. Uh, are there any other committees that you feel inclined to talk about? You were on the Meyer Library Committee, the um, Committee on Appointments and Promotions, Faculty Senate. Let's not try to cover them all, but I will mention the Meyer Library Committee, because that was an interesting story. Uh, a few years back, the word was handed down that the Meyer Library was going to be raised, that is, taken down, because it was not earthquake safe. And while it could be upgraded, uh, the decision was it would be prohibitively expensive. Where have I heard that one before? Mm -hmm. I don't think I finished the story about Encina. Of course, for us to expand in Encina was prohibitively expensive. But when we moved out, you began to hear, well, we can't have an eyesore like this, a historic building sitting here right in the middle of the campus. Somehow Stanford did raise the money uh, to upgrade that uh, uh, that facility, and it's now a very nice facility. Political science is now up on the fourth floor where we used to be. But we cannot complain because, after all, we did get a nice building uh, out of it. Going back to Meyer, the problem was what was going to be done with the uh, book collections in Meyer. Now, there wasn't much in the way of book collections in Meyer, but there was down in the basement East Asian Studies. And the East Asian Studies. So, the mandate of the committee was, we're going to close Meyer. Uh, we have to put those books somewhere. There really isn't room to take them all at Green. They would overwhelm all of Green. So what are we going to do? We've got a scarcity of resources. Uh, and I remember Dean Saller saying, when uh, once again, you know, who else in economics cares about the library? Well, an economic historian. <laughs> so the chairman appointed me. And Dean Saller said, yeah, well, we want to have an economist on the committee because economists understand about scarcity and about the need trade-offs and the need to make tough choices. So I did begin to think I was being typecast here uh, to be a bad news guy. But actually, the outpouring from uh, faculty was so intense, uh, particularly East Asian, but not only, that the provost decided to put the matter off for a couple of years. I guess we could live with the earthquake risk for a couple of years longer. And it meant that serving on the committee became much more interesting than I thought because we had the time to take a much broader view. Uh, and we ended up as a kind of a rogue committee, uh, you might say, because rather than coming in with the bad news, <laughs> we came in with the idea that uh, the university should face up to the reality that we're going to be dealing with hybrid library needs for a long time to come. That we may think that we're heading towards a digital utopia where books have disappeared entirely, but we're not there now and we're not going to be there soon, and there's some very good reasons for that. Uh, and if we're not going to destroy books, but we're going to be sending them out to storage, in Livermore, that is quite a truck ride. You have to begin to ask about the ecological virtues of trucking books in such large numbers back and forth all the time. So in short, our advice was that we needed to give much more attention to the library service with this plan uh, in mind. Uh, and that meant uh, improving the card catalog, uh, and in particular, the East Asian Studies faculty said, you know, the character recognition is nowhere near as uh, developed for uh, non-Western characters, so sending those books out to Livermore is going to be like throwing them away. Plus, they 
pointed out that Berkeley had recently opened a state-of-the-art East Asian Studies library right in the center of campus, funded by Jerry Yang himself, who had an interest in <laughs> uh, Asian uh, history and culture. Uh, so that was the nature of our report, and we got a chance to come up to the faculty, because most faculty, uh, first of all, there isn't that much of a lobbying group for the library, unless you have a special need, like the East Asian Studies people. Uh, second of all, you know, large numbers of people, their first reaction was, oh, this is the old guard. Uh, these are the stick in the muds. Uh, they don't realize uh, that uh, the new era I is here. And calling for, as we did, we called for actually a new library structure on the central campus, uh, saying that uh, we don't, didn't really expect that to be adopted, and I don't assume that it will. Uh, the one most specific outcome uh, is the new East Asian Studies Library, which is in the old um, Jackson Business School Library. Uh, and uh, I hope <laughs> the East Asian Studies people feel that their, their efforts have been rewarded, because it appears to be a really nice uh, facility, and it, they're not <laughs> being sent uh, way off to Livermore. So it, it gave me a chance to, which is rare on committees. Usually the committee is concerned with getting a report out by a deadline. We did have a report. But we, uh, it gave us a chance to reflect and think about the directions and the tools of scholarship uh, for over a 50-year uh, horizon or so. Well, very interesting. Well, the other committee that I know you were involved with wasn't really directly related to Stanford, but it was in some ways, and this is the Committee for Better Schools. And I wondered if you could talk about that for a minute. Yes, I would like to get Committee for Better Schools in on this oral history because I think it's an important chapter of local history, which is in danger of really being lost uh, to history. I'll explain. Uh, this is back in the 80s. Uh, there was a plan, not just a plan, but an active vote by the Palo Alto Unified School District School Board to close Gunn High School. Here's one of the leading high schools in the nation, and they were going to close it. Uh, and they had already closed one of the two middle schools in the district. And the plan was to close that second middle school and to make Gunn the one and only middle school um, in Palo Alto. Well, I didn't like this news. Didn't sound very appealing to me. The reasons that they were proposing to do it were that they thought the funding situation was going to be very, very grim in the future. This is a long-run implication of Proposition 13, so that local districts no longer had control over their own tax rates. Plus, the uh, court decision, Serrano Priest, which essentially was trying to equalize spending in districts across the state. Uh, so that uh, Palo Alto, being a relatively high-spending district, was, uh, could not look to the state for additional funding in the future. And so given these grim prospects and given the long-term downward trend in our enrollment levels that began with the end of the baby boom, but then uh, it continued because of high property values. Property values were high, meaning that young families uh, with children could not afford to live in the district. That was the thinking. So they took a vote. And it was John Taylor, once again, who got me involved. I had thought I didn't like it, but not much I could do about it. John had, without talking much about it, been doing research. And his research was leading him to reject all of the elements of this justification. Uh, and he convinced me. Uh, and uh, we found that there were others. Uh, we were the only two economists, but others who came to that showdown meeting uh, over at the school board uh, next to Palo Alto High School. Uh, it got, it made headlines in the San Francisco Chronicle, mostly for its exotic uh, novelty value that you had globe-trotting technology industry leaders and Stanford professors, and there were people sitting on the windows and coming out the aisles because there was so much interest. Uh, most of those people only had a very narrow agenda, which is they thought they'd been promised that Gunn High School would stay open until 1990. Most of them thought that there was really no alternative to closing it. It was a budgetary necessity, but uh, why were they moving it up by two years? 
And here come these two Stanford economists coming in there saying, no, we think you don't have to close it at all. Let's postpone the whole decision. We came in and all these other crowds of speakers, five member school board, we got absolutely nowhere. The vote was four to one and that was that. Uh, the element in the picture that made it particularly explosive is one of the things John Taylor had discovered was that local property tax revenue within the district had been rising at 9% per year. Under Prop 13, your own property value can only rise at 2% per year, but every time there's new building or every time uh, property changes hands, it's reevaluated uh, at the new market price. And those market prices had been rising. And so the district was looking at rising revenues and that rising revenue line was about to cross the revenue limit as defined by the state. So we looked into it a bit further and discovered that meant that Palo Alto would become what is known as a basic aid district. They would stop getting anything more than a token payment from the state, but in fact those local property tax revenues would stay in the district. So we discovered this. We went and spoke to the superintendent. He urged us not to go public with this information. He said <laughs> that would be explosive. If they find out about this, you know, they're going to take that money away. Well, that's pretty chilling when the superintendent tells you not to go public. However, he was not compromising one iota on his plan, which was to go ahead and close Gunn High School uh, in 1990. So we went public. We wrote a series of op-ed pieces talking about this and people were in disbelief because so many had bought into this idea that no, revenue is basically determined by the state. To make a long story short, that line did indeed cross. Palo Alto has been, and they now call it a kind of a self-funding district. Uh, and that's been going on. These events are approximately 1990 or so. So it's been going on for 25 years. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying this is fair or just that an affluent district should uh, be spending that much more than many other districts. On the other hand, uh, there's no optimal system here. You've got a group of citizens who are perfectly willing to tax themselves to pay for better schools, and yet Prop 13 says they can't do it. Uh, they've had things like parcel tax measures and so on. So that was how we got in. That was how we got nowhere. The upcoming school board election was very rare. A five-member board and there were six candidates for three positions. Three of the candidates supported the closure of gun. Three of the candidates opposed closure of gun. A rare case where an election for candidates actually decides an issue. And we were very fortunate to be able to recruit Hank Levin, who was an economist who was a professor at the Ed School. So he was the head of the ticket. We had Diane Reckless, a local parent who'd been very active, but also a, a trained economist. Uh, and the third candidate, who wasn't designed as a uh, slate and he wasn't recruited by us, but it came out that way, three and three. Uh, and sure enough, we swept the district. Uh, and it, the expression of public opinion was so clear that they immediately abandoned this long-standing close, plan to close Gunn High School. Uh, and in fact, within a few years, the foolishness of their position became so evident that this whole episode has been virtually erased from local memory. People are absolutely astounded to believe that they were ever planning to close Gunn High School, that they were ever thought that they could go to one high school and one middle school because all of these schools are now bursting at the seams. They're trying to figure out where they're going to put the additional students. So, uh, you know, we feel it's, it's certainly the most politically successful measure in, indeed as a result of our ongoing efforts. When I say our, I don't just mean John Taylor and myself, but the Committee for Better Schools. They reopened uh, Jordan Middle School, which had previously been closed. And when they closed it, they had no plans to ever reopen it again. Now it's a thriving middle school running out of room. <laughs> So uh, it's, uh, yes, the most politically successful activity that I have ever done or will ever expect to do. Uh, and it's a notable chapter in local history that somebody somewhere should remember and uh, maybe write it down sometime. Yeah. 
couple couple follow up questions. So, was there a big economic change going on here in Palo Alto at that time? I mean, were, did you have a sense of it being the Silicon Valley yet? Oh yeah, no, it, it was definitely Silicon Valley uh, as of uh, 1990. Um, now, sure, it's been <laughs> measures since then have been dwarfed by then. Uh, it seems that's one of the regularities. Each decade around here, you think property values can't possibly go up any further, and then, and then they do. But it, it, it was not declining. No, the real shock had been the previous generation, where they did have the uh, end of the baby boom, uh, forcing the closure of uh, many elementary schools. And that was very contentious. Also, there was a famous uh, uh, third high school, Coverly High School. Uh, it's now still owned by the district and leased out to a lot of different uh, agencies. And uh, uh, so it's a revenue raiser as well as a community resource. So that was very painful indeed. Uh, but uh, it wasn't that, uh, that this was uh, a poor and not yet discovered area. Uh, it was definitely... Uh, on the trajectory that you see now. It's on the rise. And then what did you do during this campaign? It sounds like it, you were quite active in it. So what was your involvement? I often w really? wonder in the sense that we did not have email. We were communicating by telephone, by and large, and we would write up memos. Uh, well, uh, the two things that I did were to kind of become uh, an after-dinner speaker that, not really after-dinner, but we would invite people in. This is school board politics is pretty localized, pretty neighborhood based. So uh, some interested person would uh, invite a bunch of neighbors in for coffee. And I would come in and usually I was paired. Uh, one of the members of our group was Nikki Smith, uh, who was uh, an experienced educator, had been on the school board in Madison, Wisconsin. And she was the wife of Marshall Smith, who was the dean of the ed school. Oh, oh yes. She is now principal of Ohlone School uh, in Palo Alto. But, uh, you know, so I would be kind of the expert, uh, the economics expertise, and I had a one-page uh, handout that everyone could look at. You know, here was the budget, here was the property fund, and here's where it uh, was five years ago, and so on. Because the board had been putting out this idea that they were running a $3 million deficit, and the property tax fund was about uh, 15 million. So people looked at that and said, oh, we've got five years here, desperate. They really were exaggerating. And so uh, I was in the position of having to study those budget documents very carefully and uh, come up with a more realistic uh, uh, picture of, uh, of the budget picture. And then I wrote, uh, Op-ed pieces, uh, actually, we raised money for a, a full-page ad in the Palo Alto Weekly, uh, and the headline was, Who Says We Can't Afford It? So that was, <laughs> I consider it one of my greatest pieces of written uh, uh, advocacy uh, in economics. I was saying, you know, the whole idea, oh, we, we wish we could keep the school open, but we can't afford it. And you look around at all the neighboring districts, most of whom had nowhere near as much money as Palo Alto did, and they were not doing uh, the kind of uh, far-fetched uh, move that Palo Alto was proposing to do. Right. And you also were involved in recruiting candidates to run for the school board election? Well, that, that was a high priority, because without candidates. Now, both John Taylor and I considered running as candidates. It would have been... Uh, you know, interesting adventure. We both decided we just did not want to. We were committed, but not that committed. And actually, I think that was a wise decision, as proved by Hank Levin. He was willing to do it because he could see the picture. Uh, you know, people are making up their minds about this, but your credibility as a Stanford economist makes a huge difference. That's why it's not so much the details of the reports we wrote, but just the fact that Stanford economists were standing up for this. Well, Hank was both a Stanford economist and an education expert, so the fact that he was running gave the whole thing real credibility. The truth is he didn't have the time to be a conscientious school board member. He could come in a meeting and weigh in on that. But nonetheless, uh, I think the fact of his running and winning was uh, mm -hmm. a big key, a key to the success. It's kind of reminding uh, me of you back in the 1970s. Well, I did feel rejuvenated uh, by this. 
the, the big difference being that back in New Haven, you know, we were working with or alongside the New Haven black community. So trying to understand what their goals were, what their vision was, how it should be articulated, how we could help them. Here in Palo Alto, it was us. Uh, and actually that was one of the main problems we had to deal with is the knee-jerk assumption that any parent who was in there campaigning to keep Gunn High School open must be a parent with a student who's going to be directly affected. You have self-interested parents and that gives you a quick way to reject. Well, I was a self-interested parent, that was true. John Taylor was not, his kids were younger. Uh, and uh, many others were not directly involved, but so what if you are directly involved? That gives you a strong motivation. Uh, but you can't just go out to the public and say, I'm doing this because of my own self-interest. You've got to make the economic case that it's feasible and it would be better uh, for the long haul. And now I look at those schools. I mean, I try to restrain myself when I speak to someone from Gunn. But every once in a while, I will slip and say, you know, I saved this high school. <laughs> you wouldn't be here <laughs> if it weren't for me. Uh, but as I say, I don't say that very often, which is why I want a chance to put it into the oral history record. Put it on the record. Okay, um, I just want to pause for a minute. Yep.